1 Samuel chapter 2 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and I'm endeavoring to get in the right frame of mind. Uh, I'm not surprised that Charlie can waltz. There are all kinds of things that he knows how to do and that he has done. That you just randomly ask him a question. One time I said, Charlie, you ever, you ever picked coffee? And he said, yeah. Yeah, I used to you know, be a coffee picker. Like, oh, well, that's interesting. Just any, any number of things like that that you find out. But that was pretty impressed because of the space that he had, that he knew the moves and everything to waltzing. And I just can't believe a guy that can waltz is still single, you know, at this age. You know, you'd think ring or no ring. Some girl would go for that. So he's probably the only man here that can do Well, I hope he's the only man here that can do that. First Samuel chapter 2. <laughs> Verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by Him actions are weighed. Father, I pray this evening that we would be impressed by what Hannah came to know about You. And God, I pray that the impression would not just be knowledge, but it would be uh, the reality of what we know about You as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm a little bit uh, taken aback this evening because my microphone didn't act up this morning. Or tonight, and I just I'm kind of waiting for that adjustment minute to get ready to preach tonight. You know, you know, preachers get habits that a lot of times they're not even aware of, sort of like vocal clutter. Some of my habits are taking things out of my pockets and uh, just kind of getting freed up before I preach. And uh, anyway, but the microphone working is a marvelous thing. Praise the Lord for that. Maybe it'll continue to do so. <laughs> How about this text? How about Hannah's? beginning of her praise, her song uh, about the Lord. How about that? Isn't that something? What she said. You know, uh, usually on Mother's Day or some kind of a Ladies' Day, a lot of times we'll preach out of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and preach about, uh, you know, Elkanah's two wives, Peninnah and, and um, Penina, Peninnah and Hannah. And uh, we will talk about the prayer that she gave to the Lord, and we'll talk about Hannah as a mother. Really the remarkable thing about this account, of course, is God. The remarkable story here is God and what God did. Now Hannah, we don't take anything away from her as a, as a human, as an individual. She was a wonderful lady that desired to have a child and was willing to dedicate the child to God. But this letter... Uh, this or this uh, record, First Samuel introduces us to an individual who was probably the greatest judge in Israel, the most effective judge in Israel, certainly judge for one of the uh, longest periods of time. Who was also the judge who was instrumental in Israel's transition from there being no king in Israel to there being a king in Israel. So. Samuel certainly was an important judge. Samuel also was a priest, which uh, was a unique was unique as far as judges go. And so the purpose in the scripture of introducing us to Hannah ultimately is to show God's plan. God's plan. And Hannah is one of those women that God used in his plan. We know her story, don't we? She was barren, and her husband had another wife who had lots of kids. And the other wife, she even describes a couple of times as her adversary. Elkanah was good to Hannah. Uh, Elkanah's other wife, Peninnah, was not good to Hannah. Every time of the year when uh, Elkanah would go and he would take care of his lot, and then he would give a portion to each of his wives. And the scripture says about Elkanah that he gave her, gave Hannah, a worthy portion. In other words, he treated her very well. And when she was vexed and bothered 
about not ha about being barren, his response was, "Am I not better to thee than ten sons?" In other words, it, it kind of indicates that perhaps he gave her a portion, as though she had ten sons, or gave her for her and her children, as though she had children, even though she had none. Now, Cana's treatment of her was pretty good. I, I don't want to get into a segue discussion about uh, polygamy and the justice of it. Uh, we know what Jesus said, we know what God said, that uh, marriage is between a male and a female, it's man and a woman, and uh, these twain, these two, shall be one flesh. And there's, no, there's no lack of clarity in the Scripture in it. I'm always just amazed by God's mercy. Mercy's not new in the church age in this dispensation. God's always been a merciful God. Amen. And He's a God that in spite of the fact that there are reasons we will be disqualified from serving Him or from uh, being His children. He's just a merciful God that, uh, in spite of what you are, is able to take what you are and work His plan. And this woman, Hannah, certainly was blessed. We know the story, don't we? She promised God, she made Him the promise, that if God gave her a son, that she would give him to the Lord. And so now she has come, and she's taken uh, her three bullocks, an ephah, flour, a bottle of wine, brought them to the house of the Lord, and she reminded Eli who she was. Remember the lady that was praying that she thought was drunk, that I was, uh, I was devastated, I was overwrought before the Lord, and now God's given me the son, and now here he is. And you think Eli is saying, oh boy, <laughs> I didn't have enough of my own, I guess I'll raise yours too. No, I don't know what Eli's response to it was, but this is definitely part of God's plan because remember what happened to Hophni and Phinehas. And so this is God's plan to make sure that there is a qualified man of God in Israel, and that would be Samuel. Well, that kind of introduces us to our context this evening, just kind of brings us into this place. But now that Samuel has been brought as his little child, as a young child, into the temple, Hannah now is offering a prayer to the Lord. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of sermons as well about Hannah's not going back on her promise, not uh, saying, God, I'll give you the child. If you give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you. And now when, you know, she has him, changing her mind, as a lot of people do. That isn't really the, that isn't the force of the story anyway. It's just notable about Hannah and her character. She seems to be a woman of notable character. And it seems that the way that she weaned Samuel, in other words, the way that he was raised, up to the point that he was able to uh, not be, uh, not not have to have his mother with him. The way that he had been raised in those formative years seems to have really shaped his character in a lot of ways, and so he was a remarkable child, a love child, and uh, it just the way that God used him. I believe a lot could be said about the way that he was raised in those formative early years. It's incredible how much. Uh, of a child's character is shaped by parenting in the first couple of years, first probably year and a half, two years. A lot's accomplished. You know, if to me, I don't see children as human until two, but I think that probably, uh, <laughs> my wife says, don't say that. Uh, she thinks I mean it. That's why she wants me to say it. So <laughs> it's not true. Uh, but now, the thing that really is notable about Hannah, in my opinion, is her theological depth. I, I think if you're going to talk about Hannah, uh, what I'm going to say is a unique characteristic of Hannah is the way that she knew the Lord. In my mind's eye, I can imagine her going to Eli as she went to her Le Levite priest husband and saying, let's pray about having a child. Let's trust God in faith about this matter. And I can see Okana saying, you don't need a child, I'm not going to ask God for that. I see Levi saying, I mean, not Eli, Levi. I see, man, I, I am bad. It, it's Sunday p.m. I love the Sunday p.m. service, but my brain is not always very sound by this time of the day. I see Eli uh, saying to her, hey, are you drunk? What's going on with you? But what was really going on with Hannah is that she actually, she actually knew how to pray. She actually knew how to go before the Lord 
and she actually knew what to value. Whereas for Hannah, if you ever think about it from the standpoint of a mother, for Hannah to dedicate her child to the Lord, what mother would want to do that? Well, the answer is any mother that loves the Lord and wants to see her child. I mean, how could Samuel have, how could Samuel have turned out? How could Samuel have done greater things than what God did with Samuel? How could he have been a greater man? I mean, isn't every mother's desire to raise children that achieve greatness? And I'm not talking about greatness in man's eyes. I'm just talking about actual greatness. Greatness in God's eyes. And when you begin to ask, how did Hannah accomplish this with Samuel? How did she get a couple of formative years in a lad's life? Turn him over to the service of the temple and have him turn out well. This is not a normal upbringing, is it? So how did God have Samuel's life? How did Samuel have a relationship with God? Well, I think it, a lot of it was due to his mother. And so uh, let's look at what she said about God. She began by saying, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. So she went from being uh, grieved to <clears throat> rejoicing. She said, uh, mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. St. Hannah certainly saw her predicament as the way that she was treated by Penina, the situation she was in with not being able <coughs> to have a child to carry on the uh, seed of Elkanah. Certainly saw that as, as a captivity that she was delivered from. And then we see some insight into what she saw in God. She said, there is none holy as the Lord. Hannah saw God as unique, as set apart, without peer or compare. Why is it that God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Why is that? I shall not make to thee any graven image. Why is that? Well, actually, it's not just because God is right to be worshipped. It's because there's nobody like God. There's no, other, there's no one like Him. He's, she, she said there's none holy as the Lord. One of the things we find in Hannah's life here is she has not accused God for her circumstances. God, why do I have to be... Why do I have to have a husband that has another wife? I think that every woman would feel that way. Isn't that so? Why, why would I have to have a husband... As you say, well, Pastor, you know, polygamy was the thing in the day. It never went well. It never worked well. The, you, every instance you see of it recorded in the Scripture, you see the conflict, the turmoil, and the bad results of it. It wasn't God's plan. It wasn't God's way. And uh, yet Hannah found herself in that circumstance. You say, well, why did she marry her husband? Well, I suspect that she didn't really have a say in that matter. I suspect it was a matter of submitting to her parents and uh, submitting to something that a circumstance she didn't have a, a say in. And then she goes on to say, There's neither, There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. She said, God, you're the only one. God, you're the only one. You know, for many of us, God is not the only one. Sometimes He's our last resort. For Hannah, God was the only one. Hannah didn't say, God, I've got nobody else. Eli, Elkanah, Benina, nobody will help me. No, she just simply said, you're the, you're the only one because you are the only one. I believe that one of the first things that we see as a characteristic of Hannah was that she saw God as the only one sufficient to deliver her. Friend, if you and I could learn to go to God first, how often do we make a decision or solve something before we ever say, God, I need help? How often do we make a phone call before we pray? How often do we consult an expert before we pray? You know, the first thing we ought to do is just say, God, I, we don't. no one knows anything but you. And so before I start calling around asking people, could you give me wisdom first on who to call? 
Or God, could you give me wisdom so I don't need to call? Or God, could you give the person I'm going to call wisdom? Because without you, there is no wisdom. That was Hannah's mindset. That was her attitude. In verse 3, she rebukes those who would think that they could stand up to God or His plan or be arrogant against Him. Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Boy, that is a verse, isn't it? You need one for your scripture memory? That's a good one, isn't it? Let's read it again. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions have weighed. While Hannah is being mistreated by Eli's other wife, she's mindful that no one anywhere gets away with anything. Why do the heathen rage and people imagine a vain thing? The rulers of the earth have, you know the, you know the passage of Scripture, how could someone be so arrogant, so proud? You know, it's interesting when God uses the Assyrians to bring Israel into captivity and to judge Israel, that the kings raise themselves up and say, I've conquered God's people and therefore I've conquered God. And God said, no, you're just a, just a rod in my hand and I'm going to break the rod. I'm going to smash the rod. You and I have to be careful, don't we? You have to be careful about, you know, I do wonder, you know, you look at Eli and, I mean, I mean Elkanah and Hannah and Penina, and you ask the question, you know, which of, which of Elkanah's wives has God blessed? Which of God's wives has God blessed? Penina could say, well, isn't it evident who's blessed? Look at me. Look at what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look what I have. God knows why Penina had ten sons, or, or I mean, not ten sons, but why she had sons and daughters who are nameless. Who are nameless, who we don't know their names. Whilst Hannah had a son that everybody knows his name and who he is and how God used him. God knows, doesn't He? God knows. And in those hours when it seems as though individuals would be speaking things that are either lies or would seem like they're overwhelming, uh, conquering odds or obstacles or truths that are against you and you just have to say, why God? Hannah said, God knows and God judges. God knows and God judges. And that's a good reminder for each of us, isn't it? The bows of the mighty men are broken and they that stumbled are girded with strength. I'm reminded here not uh, only of many incidents, but particularly the first one that comes to my mind is Jericho. It's great walls. A people that were described by most of the spies that went into the land as these people compared to them were grasshoppers. And I'm reminded that they walked around Jericho and the walls fell down. I'm reminded of Ai. When they said, okay, this is just a little puny city, this is a small group, and we'll go there, and yet things weren't right. And I'm reminded of how the arrogant and the proud, who should have depended on God, realized there ain't God. It's important for us in instances, even when God has done great things, to remember it's God that does the great things. And God's not impressed by strength or might. In my lifetime, I cannot, uh, I could probably for days recount how God has done the impossible against insurmountable odds. How many of us could testify of things that God has done that are against all odds? God does that frequently. It's nothing to Him. They that stumbled are girded with strength, so the mighty are made weak and the weak are made mighty. Then he, she said in verse 5, they that were full have hired out themselves for bread. Individuals said, man, I mean, they were on top of the world. This is just, a, for instance, that many of us would know about, but anybody remember a man by the name of Bertie Madoff? Pretty well known in South Florida, wasn't he? One of the uh, richest billionaires in South Florida. Was he a billionaire? He was a multimillionaire. 
Was he what? Cutting close. Yeah, I think he was around a billionaire. And uh, well, he's in prison today. And his poor wife is, you know, uh, working a small job and living very, very different, frugally, in comparison with how she used to live. And uh, that's just an illustration that comes to mind. Of course, I'm not... Uh, I'm not saying that, that, that they are the individuals, but the Bible says they that are full have hired themselves out for bread. Man, I'll tell you, circumstances can change. You can go from the top to the bottom. And you can also go to the, from the bottom to the top. The Bible says, And they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren had borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. All of a sudden, God's reversed roles, role reversal. Verse 6, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The same God that would say, okay, your time is up, is the same God that said, Lazarus, your time isn't up yet. Lazarus, come forth. We have a God who is unlimited in the scope of His ability to reverse situations. How many times it just seems as though it, that's game over, that down for the count. This is, this is the end. And then God said, no, it isn't. It's not anything like the end. And He just reversed roles. That's the God that we know. Same God. Uh, verse 7, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. Studying the Scripture carefully and looking at God's heart for the poor helps me not to misunderstand what God is saying here in His Word. In other words, Hannah is not being used by the Holy Spirit to say, you know, God makes people poor and poor are bad. What he's saying is God can take anyone from here to here and from here to here. And He bringeth low and lifteth up. Sometimes we need to be brought low, don't we? Those low moments in life, those low moments in life shape us in the best of ways. I think some of the times the high, the high, uh, you know, we talk about valleys and mountaintops. Sometimes the mountaintops don't shape us as well as the valleys do. But God brings us from valleys to mountaintops wherever He pleases. And, you know, I just love Job when he said, The Lord giveth, hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job certainly could have said, Yeah, Hannah, you're right about that. You're right. I mean, from here to below the ground, literally all the way back up to where he never was before. Job would be an example of what Hannah says here. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dung hill. <laughs> this is like most good preachers, I think. <laughs> I don't know how many men that God has mightily used that come from the worst of places. Isn't it true? It just seems like the people that God uh, uses in the greatest way come from the lowest of places. And it's just something else. I, I like uh, reading and, and looking at testimonies of old guys like Gypsy Smith and uh, Billy Sunday. And just individuals that God's used to mightily. If you ever read the writings of Billy Sunday or read the writings of Gypsy Smith, you realize these guys, they're, just, they just, they're not too deep. There isn't a whole lot there. Nobody knows who Ryan Price is. But everybody knows who Billy Sunday is. How is that? Well, it's God. That's what it is. It's God. God takes some guy that's uh, drunk on Skid Row and he can save his soul, turn his life around, and make something out of him. It's kind of a God he is. And the uh, Bible says, He raised up the poor and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Now this is comforting, isn't it? And God will keep the feet of the saints. Well, just keep us to guard or protect, to watch over. And you're walking, and boy, you could stumble or you could fall, and God will protect you from that. And then the Bible says, The wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Mano a mano comparisons oftentimes show us as weaker than a wicked adversary. But for those that are the Lord's, 
there's no mano a mano comparison. There's no man to man. It's man to God. If you fight against God's child. And that's a comforting place to rest in. I'm just incredibly amazed at Hannah's perspective here. I do not think that the gist of what she is testifying here, she came to realize after God gave her a child. I think this is the gist of the reason why God gave her a child. This is a kind of woman uh, that could raise a child to know the Lord. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. I don't like the term karma. I don't really use it. Uh, it's not coincidental. But justice. Justice. If ever an individual could say, it's not right, it's not fair, it's unjust. Hannah. But ultimately, what is Hannah's testimony of God here? She's saying there is no injustice. God makes things right. What God does is right. And you can't, you can't oppose the Lord. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall, shall, be th shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And he shall give strength unto his king. And exalt the horn of his anointed. And Elkanah went to Ramah his house. And the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Well that made an impression on me as I read this prayer of Hannah and her rejoicing before the Lord and what she'd said. Hannah had an impression of God that I believe impressed God. Now, now listen to me. You say, Pastor, how do I get God to do things for me the way that God did for Hannah? How do I get God to vindicate me the way God vindicated Hannah? And you say, well, Pastor, it's not right to want to be vindicated. No, it's not right to want to avenge yourself. But God is the avenger. Vengeance is His. And for Hannah, the role reversal is something she desired and isn't wrong for her to want, to desire that. How do you get God to do for you what Hannah did? You know, I made a statement this morning in this morning's message. It was in passing. But it's reality, and that is that God never does great things before we exercise faith. God does great things as a result of an exercise of faith. And I believe the same would be true here for Hannah as well. He asked the question, did God give Hannah Samuel so that she would know what kind of God that he was? And I think the answer to the question would actually be the opposite is true. God gave Samuel to Hannah because she knew what kind of a God he was. And so the question for us here this evening is, do you know what kind of a God he is? This afternoon, Charlie asked a question about something. What was that question? I said two, two answers. How do we know about God's mercy? And the answer that I gave, of course, just mostly just to distract Charlie, but the answer that I gave was, we know about God's mercy from reading about it. Well, there are things I know about God because I read His Word. And I know His Word is true, and so I just believe them without having experienced them. Because the Bible is the Word of God, and God doesn't lie, and you can trust, you can believe His Word. And the second way we know about God's mercy is by experiencing it for ourselves. I can know about it by reading about it and believing it. And I can also know about it by exercising it and experiencing it. And I think that would be true of all the mighty things that Hannah shares about God and His justice. I want to conclude this evening by saying God is a just God. He's a God of great justice. He's a God who can reverse roles. The heathen may be raging, and God is certainly not unaware. And you know, one of the things that you and I can take away from this in full confidence is that there is no one who should be arrogant or proud against the Lord, or thinking, well, God's not doing anything about me. Well, my friend, God absolutely is going to deal with you. And then the other is we ought not be fearful. Well, God's not doing anything about them. And the response is God absolutely will do something about them. It's in His character. That would be a great thing to get settled on, wouldn't it? 
What are we going to do if our government... Well, don't worry about it. God will, God will deal with them. Well, what's going to happen if this person doesn't or this person does? Don't worry about it from that sense. You go to the Lord, you ask Him about it, but ask Him about it on the basis of what you know about His character because God doesn't do anything wrong and He is certainly never unjust. So, Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening from this great prayer of this woman who knew a God who was able to reverse roles from good to evil and evil to good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.